Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, our first uh, Python conference, so we're very, very pleased to be here. We're enjoying it very much so far. Uh, I'm Philippe Masson. And I'm Rita Kasserani. And we're both from uh, JP Morgan. We work in the Quantitative Research Group. And the Quantitative Research Group is a modeling group. We develop the mathematical models, method methodologies, and tools to solve um, business problems. For instance, we develop the models to uh, value financial transactions. We also use data science and machine learning to provide uh, market analytics to traders and marketers. But we're not here to, to talk about us. No, we're here to talk about another group. We're here to talk about our real life story about giving Python to non-developers. So this is a story about people who are not developers and what happened to them when we gave them access to Python. Did they learn to control Python? Or did they get entangled? So the answer to that will be given later. But first, we're going to tell you about who the characters of this story are, why we gave them access to Python, how we gave them access to Python, and what they did with it. Then we will reflect about what we learned from giving them access, and then about whether you should be giving Python to non-developers. So all good stories have characters. Who are they in our story? So we are trying to teach Python to more than 5,000 people in markets, meaning people, salespeople and traders. So they don't have mostly, most of them don't have formal development background, but they are all numerate, and we know they have the potential to learn how to code. So they are all spread across the globe, and so the function of a salesperson or a trader is mainly to help institutional investors to trade in um, financial instruments. So. The, uh, what drives them the most is the amount of profit and losses they are making at the end of each day. And this also explains how busy they are throughout the day. So the day of a trader will look a lot like what you see at the bottom of the slide. So they will start very early at around 6 p.m. Until 5 p.m. they will be very busy. They will barely leave the desk. They will even eat on the desk. And it's only after 5 p.m. that we can get, uh, grab a bit of their attention. So you can see how challenging it can be to teach a trader to code in Python. But what makes us hopeful is that we know they could, use, uh, they could derive a lot of value from using data. They could make faster, better, more accurate, and even more profitable decisions by using data through Python. Um, they, to, to give you some practical examples of what traders could do, they could do automated trading, for example. They could do deep hedging, so using data-driven data approaches to, to hedge the risk of a portfolio just to give you some examples. Now, why did we embark in this challenge? So first of all, we're getting more and more data every day. And as I said before, there is so much value that could be derived from it. So why not starting and get more value in our business? Also, we are getting more competitions from fintechs and hedge funds who are leveraging data and tech a lot. And so to stay ahead of this competition, we also need to do the same. Skill gap prevention. So in a few, uh, few years from now, coding in Python might, might become a critical skill. And the salespeople and traders at JP Morgan are the ones um, that know the market data the most. They are the data experts. And we want them to be the ones coding a few years uh, ahead from now. Technology is evolving every day. And so, our, so are our client needs. And so for that reason, we need to stay on top of all the changes and evolvements that are going on. And finally, we know we could derive so much profitability and efficiency by coding uh, and automating few of our workflows. Now, so these were the external reasons of why teaching Python to non-developers. Why, what are the internal ones? What, so to know the motive internally at JP Morgan, we asked our traders and salespeople directly. We sent the survey and uh, we asked them specifically these two questions. And we were surprised to see that two out of three um, of respondents 
said they agreed that data and analytics, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence will increase profitability and efficiency in their business. But 50, more than 50% of them say they don't know how to, to get started. So the good thing is they know the importance of data, of starting to code, but they just don't know how. So our response to that was, like, was that, OK, we will show you the way with our market data and analytics training program. Now, um, <laughs> what are we trying to achieve with this? So how many of you uh, are familiar with this screenshot? Please raise your hand. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is to move away from all these um, manual data handling and extraction using Excel to more of what you see below. So you can see um, on the left being able to automatically feed data into visualization tools, uh, having live dashboards, being able to create live insights and make decisions out of data. We also have our... Um, a lot of manual pricing tools, so being able to move from manual pricing to automated pricing. And finally, almost everyone uses a spreadsheet, so why not just automate these spreadsheets? At a more advanced stage, we would like them to be able to send, for example, um, automated custom customized email to clients, uh, use uh, machine learning and AI to make decisions. But to be able to do all that, there is something very critical we need um, to start with, is giving them access to Python. So, Philippe, how, oh, how do we give them access to Python? That's a great question. Thank you very much, Rita, for asking it. Well, in this story, giving access to Python really means giving access to Athena. So, what is Athena? Athena is the trade and risk management system within JP Morgan. It's built in-house, and it's very big. It has over 50 million lines of Python code, so it's actually one of the largest mono repositories in the world. It has access to a 1,000 external uh, libraries, and it has over 4,000 developers. And the great thing that Athena does for this program is that it provides access to data with internal or external data, and it provides access to analytics. And this access is both simple and safe. And this is very important. Both, both points are very important. Because the access has to be simple so that people who are non-developers can be productive very quickly. And by providing interfaces, which means that um, traders can access data and analytics with just a few lines of code, means that they are productive very quickly. But the second point is also extremely important. The access has to be safe. So Athena takes care of that. For instance, Athena will ensure that you only access the data that you are entitled to see. But Athena also provides a um, software development lifecycle with unit tests and with controls about when code gets to production. So Athena is a key part of this, uh, of this program. Now, in more details, how do we give access to Athena to the traders? Well, it depends on the traders and sales. It, it depends on the, the level of proficiency. If they are complete novices, typically, they would start with Jupyter notebooks. They would uh, write their code in a script fashion. They will execute that code manually. And then to view the results, they would view it either directly in the Jupyter Notebook, or they might use some visualization tools like Perspective or Tableau. Now, as they become more experienced, more proficient, they move to a more advanced setup. And they use a full IDE, for instance, Visual Studio. They might start writing their own functions or their own classes. And they would typically then execute those automatically using the Athena scheduler. And then to view the results, of course, they can still use the visualization tools, but they can also write some simple applications, for instance, using Voila, which allows you to build applications from Jupyter. Now, um, 
how should I say that? Why are we here? I mean, why are we here in this um, Python conference? Well, that's because Python is a key success factor of, the, of this program. Python has some key strength, which makes it really suitable to this type of uh, initiative. The first point is that Python provides an easy entry point. We saw in the previous slide. Um, so Python has an easy syntax to read. It's easy to learn. It takes care of memory management. And it doesn't need project compilation. So this is ideal for a new starter. But also, like we saw on the previous slide, there is a path from that easy starting point to a fully fledged language with object orientation, for instance. And so it can be very powerful once you've uh, learned how to use it. But also, Python provides access to lots of libraries. And that's because Python has been around for a while. And also, more importantly, has a brilliant community, which you're all part. So you're all contributing to these slides. Thank you very much. But also, within JP Morgan, Python also provides access to Athena. And then another strength of Python is the fact that because you don't have to pro uh, compile it at project level, it's very easy to have lots of people working on it uh, at the same time. Now, I don't want to pretend that the world is perfect. I don't even want to pretend that Python is perfect. There are some downsides to Python. Sometimes people mention speed. In, for this initiative, it's not such a, a big issue. We're not writing code that has to, well, the trades are not writing code that have to run lightning fast. I would say, in, for this initiative, maybe the, the main downside is that it's hard to enforce interfaces. Because in Python, once you have access to a script or to a class, you then get access to all the functions in that script or all the methods in that class. And that means that people who are not so experienced at development might be calling some of the inside of the class, for instance, rather than the standard interface. And they might therefore ma make their code harder to maintain in the long run. And we try to mitigate this risk via training. So Rita, what sort of training do we provide in this program? So we launched last year our market data and analytics training program. And the goal of this program was to upskill the sales and trading organization and to have them start automating some of their workflow. Our training is split into two main streams. The first one targets everybody, the whole organization, and the second one is for our power users. So the power users are those who already have the analytical skills or those who want to develop them or even would benefit from it the most. In our first stream that we called overview stream, uh, we mainly try to raise awareness about the topic and its importance, while in the second stream, the power users, it's mainly technical skills to really, uh, technical sessions to provide the skills to the participants. And one of the goals of our training is actually to grow our power users community. So here you will see the small blue circle is the representation of how many power users we have today. And the goal of the training is to slowly make this circle bigger and bigger with time. So we want to have more power users with time. And our main generator to grow this power users community is our ADAPT program, which stands for Athena Data and Analytics Python Training. It's a three weeks training, two hours per day, and we also give it for each region separately so we can have it after market hours so we know the traders can focus. Uh, and it's mainly here to, um, to teach the basics of Python, data science, uh, and Athena. We also, uh, so after taking ADAPT, our participants get certificates. And to keep the training challenging and exciting, we also have competitions. So we have, uh, this year we had, we had them to code the best trading strategy. And we rank them based on specific metrics. And it's actually in two weeks that we will announce the winners and the exciting prizes. So Philippe and I talked about the training and the infrastructure, which are key elements to upskilling an organization. Another key element that we shouldn't underestimate is the culture. A lot of people would reach out to us saying, I don't think this training is relevant to me. My, work my workload doesn't allow me to do that. And most of the these people think that because they don't know what they don't know. 
and they, they don't know the value Python can bring or coding can bring to their day-to-day. -day. So this challenge needs a uh, need solution across all levels. So starting from the top, at the senior management level, uh, we want them to cascade all the important, important messages. So for example, we want our senior leaders to show the, clearly through their communications that data and analytics is becoming a priority, that juniors have to start taking the trainings. At the manager's level, uh, we want them to encourage their team to participate in the training and to also start, um, start developing some analytics at work and uh, they should also uh, they should celebrate successes in their teams, explain the failures, and move forward without giving up. Finally, at the junior level, uh, this is specifically one where we target them to take an, um, we, to tar we target them to take technical trainings because the new joiners have most time, most energy. They are very enthusiastic and creative. Uh, also, they know the workflows the best. So practically, they would be the best people to put in, into practice anything they learn. Um, through our training. Now, we're com coming to a slide with numbers. Sorry, we had to do it. So uh, these are the key results of our training. So one, one person uh, out of two uh, of the organization attended at least one of our events. One out of five said the, they were able to generate some analytics ideas uh, thanks to our training. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but we're still in early days and we're hoping this number will increase. Also, the majority of these people were actually able to implement some kind of analytics at work. Another interesting fact that we observed with the numbers is the targeting, the targeting of our uh, training worked quite, quite well. So if we look on the, on the bar charts, uh, the first ones, it's the power user sessions. We can see that it's mostly juniors who have attended these sessions, uh, while, um, while in the overview session, it was the other way around, so mostly seniors. And it's exactly what we wanted and expected. So we wanted our overview sessions to mainly target managers and play a role in the culture, while we wanted our technical sessions uh, to target juniors that will put into practice what they learn. Finally, a key metric that we are, uh, we are uh, looking at is the Athena users weekly that we have in sales and trading. So the graph, the, the graph on the right here will show you weekly the number of users we have. It's, we can see that it's slowly growing. Uh, so in one year, we got around 20% increase in weekly users. And you can see the, the three peaks. So this is our adapt training. A lot of people taking the training at the same time. It's true that it's dropping right after the training because not everybody continues to use uh, Athena. But it's, it's dropping at a level slightly above uh, prior to the training, which is kind of a positive outcome, although a bit slow. We're also ex experiencing, experiencing some challenges in our training so that we want to address. The first one is having these people move from using Jupyter notebooks to pushing tools to production. So this, this is one challenge we'll need to address. Another one is uh, keeping the training relevant to everybody. So for example, our DAP training is general. So we teach the basics of, um, of Python. Uh, but some groups might have specific requirements uh, on accessing specific kind of data, for example. So also this is something we would need to address. And finally, the cultural challenge that we already mentioned. So convincing managers uh, that this is actually a priority and it can bring value to their business so that they can also push their teams to get started. So we now come to the conclusion part of this talk. First, we're going to answer the question from the beginning of the talk, where we asked about develop, non-developers, whether they learn to control Python or whether they got entangled. Well, they didn't get entangled. They actually did provide some analytics. And they started to see uh, writing Python as part of their role. Some of them actually really took to Python. In fact, here is a recent team photo. Anyway, more concretely, what did we learn in this, um, uh, from this initiative? And what did we learn about giving um, access to Python to non-developers? Well, the first thing we learned is that it's actually possible. Now, this wasn't a given when we started about a year ago. You know, some of the, these people had never written code. Um, so it was, we were pleased to see that um, they have uh, taken it on. Now, we also learn that it takes time. As you saw on the, 
previous graph, you know, the increase is gradual. It's not like we gave Python and then all of a sudden step jump and we had thousands extra users. You know, it is gradual. You have to give it time. And you also need the su support of, um, of uh, management to, uh, to change that. And um, you, we, you also have to improve, sorry, change the culture. But targeting the junior people is working well. We see that there's a lot of uptake in, uh, in junior people for this program. And then finally, um, we learned that the training has to be targeted. You only get so far with generic uh, training. You, in order to make people use Python, you have to show them how to use it in their particular area. And so we've been now designing workshops that are really targeted so that uh, people can really work f for their own area. So, what's in it for you? Should you give Python to non-developers? Right. So to answer this question, I'm going to need your help. So can I please ask you all to stand up? I promise you it's going to be great. Fantastic. Oh, there's people, OK, yeah, yeah, brilliant. OK, so now, to give Python to non-developers, there are some key ingredients that you need. And uh, oh, I see people stretching. That's really good. Yes, very good. Very good. So, um, so there are some key ingredients that you need to give Python to non-developers. So let's see if you have them. So in, if you have them in your organization. So either think of the organization you work in, or if you're a consultant, think maybe about a client you're working in. If you haven't got an organization, I don't know, choose your favorite Someone. pop group. Someone. Sorry. Someone. Choose Someone. anyone, <laughs> anyone. And, and think whether they, f they have these key ingredients. So the first one is about people. Do you have? non-developers who have the potential to write some simple software. If you do, st please stay standing. If you don't, you can sit down. Every oh, just one person sitting down. So the second point is, do you have existing developers in your organization who can provide the, the training and the guidance? Because without that, the non-developers won't know what to do. So if you have these people, please stay standing, otherwise you can sit down. Number three is, do you have the motive? So do you have data that can provide valuable business information? Ah, a few people sitting down, OK. Number four is, do you have the tools? So do you have an infrastructure with, <laughs> with safe and simple access to data and analytics? Uh, some people sitting there. Because that, and safe and simple, remember, are very important. Sim simple for the productivity and safe to be controlled. And finally, do you have support from management and the willingness to change the culture? <laughs> ah, oh no, so close, so close, so close. Well, anyway, so if you have all of these, if you have the people, the motive, the tool, and the willingness to change the culture, then you too can give Python to non-developers. Thank you. <laughs> right on time, 53. Thank you so much, Rita and Philippe. I'm afraid we're... Actually, no, we have time for a really short question and a really short answer. So I'm going to be as fast as I can. Thank you very much. Could you explain what sort of support infrastructure you have for users after they've completed the training, for when they get stuck? So what, what sort of infrastructure do we have after they start the training? Well, they, they, they have the, um, the Athena infrastructure, which means that, that they have access so to either you know, Jupyter Notebooks or um, an IDE where they can write, sorry, where, where they can write codes that, that calls pretty much all the, the functions that we use for, say, extracting market data for pricing uh, derivatives for um, doing some analysis on the data. Um, now, if you're talking about what sort of infrastructure in, sort of, in terms of what you know, database or what compute we have, is that a sort oh. Ah, the, the people yeah. support. Ah, OK. No, no, sorry. So in terms of people support, well, um, each area of, of, of trading typically has an associated uh, uh, technology team and an associated quantitative research team. 
and they can work with them to get the, um, the, the, the guidance or to, to get their code approved for uh, pushing it to production. Sure. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again.